Good afternoon. This is Dr. Jean Jenkins, and welcome to our second webinar in the JNS series of uh, presentations about the articles that you can find in the new genomic special issue published online February 1st. We're very excited to have Yvette Conley talking with us about current and emerging technology approaches in genomics today. You have the opportunity to post questions, and those will be addressed at the end of the session. You are on mute, but you can also raise your hand and uh, um, comment by way of typing in. We will be recording the session, and we will now start the recording. Also, if you are representing more than just yourself in attending today, could you please Note for our records by typing in how many people are actually in your room or working with you as part of listening to this webinar. And just a reminder that our next webinar will be March 5th. It will be a dual webinar from 3.30 to 4.30 with two topics, one by Dr. Shufen Wang on cardiovascular genomics and the other, an overview of the genomics of metabolic syndrome by Ann Cashin, Jackie Taylor, and their colleagues who were also involved with writing the paper. So thank you so very much. I'm going to turn over the introduction to Dr. Kathleen Calzone. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to have Dr. Rebecca speaking to you this afternoon. Um, she has her master's in genetic counseling and a PhD in human genetics, both of them from the University of Pittsburgh. And she's a tenured faculty member and associate professor with a primary appointment in the School of Nursing, as well as a secondary appointment in the Department of Human Genetics, um, all at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, she's been managing and directing molecular genetic laboratories for over 20 years um, and is fully equipped to uh, and it has a fully equipped laboratory that's actually in the School of Nursing that's focused on molecular genomics. Um, her research has focused on using a variety of genomic approaches um, to understand the biologic basis underlying variability in patient outcomes. Um, she's had funding from the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, the Alzheimer Association, and the Oncology Nursing Society. She's also director of an NINR-funded T32 titled Targeted Research and Academic Training of Nurses in Genomics, and continues to be a primary faculty member for the National Institute of Nursing Research Summer Genetics Institute. Um, and she's a standing member of the NIH Nursing and Related Clinical Sciences Studies subsection. So there's really no one who's sort of more uniquely positioned to speak to technology and how it applies to genomics and its application for nursing practice. So uh, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Conley. Okay, thank you very much. And I want to start off by thanking all of the uh, attendees and also thanking my co-authors, um, whose on behalf I'm, I'm presenting today. And the, the, the co-authors include um, Leslie, B. Secker and Stephen Consalves from the National Human Genome Research Institute, um, Carrie Merkel from University of Arizona, Maggie Kirk from University of Glamorgan in the UK, and Brad Wieserat at um, University of California, San Francisco um, are my esteemed co co-authors, um, and without whom I would not uh, be able to, to talk about all of these things. So. Um, Let's uh, move ahead. I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm hoping to, um, to talk about during the webcast. Um, so I want to briefly discuss the approaches that are introduced in, in the manuscript. So those being genome sequencing, genome-wide association studies, epigenomics, and gene expression profiling. Now, I do want to point out that I'm not going to be covering details on, on how to conduct these types of studies or the various platforms that you can use to conduct these types of studies. Um, 
I think we just don't have time to cover all of those things, but the information I'm going to provide it has, is more about how these approaches are emerging and being um, utilized and increasing in utilization for both research and clinical applications. Um, but don't worry, we, we've provided in the paper, and I'm going to address some of these towards the end of the talk. Um, we included um, a lot of online resources in the paper to assist with, with some of this information. Um, I'm also going to address implications for nursing practice and research, and then I will, time permitting, um, take you guys to some of the databases and resources um, that are out there online, and then we'll have a, a question and answer session. Um, so as far as, as genome sequencing is concerned, um, what we're interested in with, with sequencing in general is we're interested in determining the order of nucleotides. Um, so with that, you know, the orders of the order of G's, A's, T's, and C's in the, in the DNA. So in the past, um, you know, sequencing's been around for a long time. In the past, what we did was we did sequencing. We figured out the order of G's, A's, T's, and C's for a very focused piece of DNA. So a lot of times you, what you needed to do is you had to know what piece of DNA you wanted to look at. And then we had technology to help you focus in on that particular spot in the DNA that you wanted to sequence. And you would collect that data, that focus data, one base at a time using, using methodology that gave you one base at a time um, information data collection. Um, that's all changed. Now, I have to say, those old school methods of collecting sequencing data one base at a time and focusing in on a particular piece of DNA, th that is still useful today. Um, but now we do have, um, through advancement of technology, um, the ability to sequence many pieces of DNA simultaneously um, at the same time, so, so to collect these data in parallel. And it's also possible to not have to focus on a particular piece of DNA anymore. You can actually look across the entire genome and sequence the, uh, the genome now. Now, this idea of in parallel sequencing many pieces of DNA at the same time is referred to as next generation sequencing or massively parallel sequencing. Those are um, those are equally correct terminologies to use, and um, you know a lot of folks will say you know next gen sequencing, and and what they're referring to is the ability to collect DNA with this higher throughput technology that collects sequences um, many pieces of DNA at a time. So, as you can imagine, having the ability to um, actually look at greater sequencing coverage, so and, and to the extent that you could look at the whole genome from a sequencing point of view, and you can do this in a lot less time, and simultaneously the cost of doing this has come down. It makes genome sequencing way more appealing for research and clinical utility. So it, it is something that's out there being used, and it is on the forefront of being um, adopted by a lot of research and a lot of um, uh, folks doing clinical um, research and then looking to translate that research to clinical applicability. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, whole genome sequencing basically is, is you're, you're sequencing the entire genome. Now, there could be gaps in what you're able to collect from a data collection point of view, um, but for the most part, you're, you're capturing the sequence of the entire genome. Whole exome sequencing. So exome, an exome is that piece of the gene. Um, that is, it goes into the coding, that's the coding region of the gene, and your exomes, your collection of exomes across all of your genes across the entire genome is called your exome. And so we also have the ability to sequence the whole exome of the genome. So you're not doing the whole genome, but what you're doing is you're focusing in on the exome, which represents about 1% of the genome but is likely to contain about 80%, 85% of the variability that influences the phenotypes that we're interested in. So you get a lot of bang for your buck out of whole genome sequencing. You're only sequencing about 1% of the genome, so it's a little bit quicker to do and a lot less expensive than whole genome sequencing, 
um, but you're, you're, you're capturing a lot of usable data. So why would one even want to entertain doing a genome sequence? Well, if you take a step back and think about what your areas of interest are, probably the phenotypes or the traits or the conditions that you're interested in are not single gene conditions. These are probably conditions where there's multiple genes involved, maybe even gene environment interaction, and you would like to, um, you know, be able to look across all genes or um, regulatory regions of the genome, and you would like to know a little bit more about how that genome, the, the variability that that genome holds for telling you about your phenotype of interest. And because a lot of the um, conditions of high public health importance are going to be conditions where there's more than one gene, more than one variation in the genome that is impacting that condition, um, genome sequencing becomes very appealing. So one um, real advantage to genome sequencing is that it captures rare as well as common variation. So um, as far as changes to our DNA that can impact our health, there are you know, there, there's, there's a lot of folks out there who believe it's, it's rare variation that's going to be what tells us, um, uh, you know, the most about our phenotypes of interest. There are folks who believe that it's, no, 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 it's going to be common variation. Um, there's a lot of us who believe it's probably a mix of both, but genome sequencing satisfies both camps of thought because you actually will capture all of the variability in someone's um, genome by doing the, the genome sequencing. So you can see where there would be, be appeal to that. So it's a very powerful uh, approach. I mean, th this, this is something that is, you know, very much, if you can do it, gold standard. You're getting the DNA sequence of an entire genome of an individual. So a couple of things that, that folks conducting research, folk folks who are looking at the research for potential clinical utility and folks that might be using this um, down the road for clinical utility. Some things that you need to keep in, in mind is that it isn't error free and as the technology advances and as we start collecting more data and as we start to get better at managing the data, collecting the data and um, viewing the data, we'll probably have error rates go down. But right now, the average error rates for um, next-gen sequencing is, is about a half a percent to two percent. So there's a lot of call in the genomics community for labs who are reporting this sort of um, data, this genome sequencing data. Um, or exome sequencing data that you, you need to, when you're doing these reports, you need to say what genes or what exons or what regions of the genome that were not adequately assessed while you were collecting those data. And that could be because, you know, you didn't get any data from a particular piece of DNA or you got data but it, the, the quality just wasn't high enough for you to feel comfortable with that. The people who are getting the report on the other end need to know that that's something that came out of your laboratory. The other thing is the genomics community, community is, um, you know, calling for, because this is a newer technology, and anytime there's a newer technology, you know, comparing that to our more traditional um, technology that's been validated is something that, that we try to do for a while until we feel more comfortable with the newer technology. So there is a, a push out there for, you know, anything that, that you find with next-gen uh, sequencing that it, it's a good idea to validate those findings with, um, you know, a more uh, um, traditional method and um, it, to validate those findings. The other thing that I wanted to, to make sure we, we brought up um, was the idea of incidental findings. And so you, and this, this is a, a pretty hot area in genomics right now. It's a, uh, an ethical, legal, and social, um, you know, issue that has come up in the genomics community. And you can imagine how you, you set out to look at someone's genome and you're looking for variation that's involved with your phenotype of interest. 
because you're going to get a lot more information about that person's genome than what impacts your phenotype of interest, what if you were to find variation not involved with your phenotype of interest, but that has clinical importance not related to your phenotype? What do you do? You know, when you uncover that information, what do you do? What are your obligations um, to the participant, the person whose genome you're looking at? Um, and this is, this is a very hot area right now. And over the past year, um, genetics in medicine has produced um, quite a few papers um, on this topic. Um, and genetics in medicine is a product of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Um, so I would, I would bring you um, out to look at, at some of those articles um, about the topic, and, and they've even coined um, another ohm. So there's lots of ohms and lots of omics out there. Um, but the incidental ohm is, um, you know, the, the, the basically the genome, um, the information that you find out about an individual by looking at their genome sequence. Um, but it's stuff that you weren't expecting to find. And, and what are researchers supposed to do when they find an incidental, um, you know, finding that has clini potential clinical importance, um, but the samples that they're using are de-identified. The samples that they're using are from a biobank. Um, the samples that they're using, those subjects were not consented to go back and give information to them. Um, it's really raising a lot of, of interesting um, uh, dilemmas. Because, uh, once again, what's happened in the genomic community is our ability to look at the genome, characterize the genome, our technology to do all these things far surpasses and is far ahead of what we, you know, how, how, how we, you know, deal with um, the massive amounts of data that we have. Um, and, and so I think that, once again, technology is far ahead, much further ahead than what we can um, deal with when we're talking about doling out findings to, to folks. So very common issue right now um, that we're dealing with. And I would um, recommend that you look at some of those, uh, those manuscripts that have been published in um, Genetics and Medicine. Okay, so um, genome-wide association studies, or, or GWAS, as it's affectionately known. So this has this is an approach that's been around um, a lot longer. Um, you may have heard more about it. So genome-wide basically meaning that you're collecting genotype data for polymorphisms that span the entire genome. So up and down every chromosome are polymorphisms that are spaced on that chromosome, and you collect genotype data for each of those polymorphisms that span the genome. You then take those data and you analyze it statistically um, using an association approach. So by association, this is no different than statistical associations that you would look for in, in data that isn't genetic um, data. So you're looking for a relationship between two variables that make them statistically dependent. Now, in this case, it's your, your allele or your genotype of interest and your phenotype of interest. So, so you're looking um, to compare what someone's genetic material looks like to your phenotype um, and seeing if there's a relationship. So at the very basic level, what you could do and what people do do is they will analyze each polymorphism um, to see if there's an association with their phenotype of interest. And what you do is you, you, you run a, a multitude of simple association tests. Now, we do have more sophisticated analyses that are available to us. Um, for example, there are ways to look at gene-gene interactions, so you can look to see um, not only is this particular allele or this particular genotype in this gene associated, but in reality, it's um, an allele in this gene and an allele in that gene and an allele in this gene. And when I look at them in an additive way, I'm actually seeing that there are interactions between those genes and I have a strong association. Um, so that's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, pathway analyses, where you take genes that are known to interact with one another in a biological pathway and you look to see do those genes synergistically together um, 
have an association with your phenotype of interest. And so those are some very robust ways of, of looking at uh, uh, GWAS data. So the types of polymorphisms that are used most often in a, in a GWAS are your single nucleotide polymorphisms. And um, most people today who are conducting GWAS experiments, they are collecting data on anywhere from about a half a million SNPs to about two million SNPs. Um, so the reason why a GWAS works is this idea of linkage disequilibrium. So it turns out that, you know, if you think about how you get your genetic material from your biological parents, you do not get that material one base at a time. Um, you get your genetic material in chunks called chromosomes. Now, it's true that when your biological parents made gametes, there was recombination, reshuffling amongst those chromosomes that they have. But once they donated that genetic material, then that material was inherited as, as, as a chunk. And so these chunks or blocks of linkage disequilibrium are very helpful to us. It turns out that, um, you know, let's say there's 300 polymorphisms in a particular chunk of DNA, a particular um, block of linkage disequilibrium within our DNA. And if you were to genotype all 300 of those polymorphisms, you would find that if you had genotyped just one of those polymorphisms, you probably could have predicted the genotypes for almost all of those other 299 polymorphisms in that chunk of DNA. So it turns out, luckily for us, that we just look at one highly informative polymorphism in that chunk, in that block of DNA. And those are the SNPs that are then chosen for a GWAS. And, and so when you talk about a half a million or two million SNPs up and down all the chromosomes, you're not, those don't represent all the polymorphisms in the genome, but it represents a subset that help us capture the majority of the um, variability in the genome. And so you're, you're looking for association with a chunk of DNA when you do a GWAS um, analysis. Now, the most common design is a case control uh, uh, study. And so you could think of this like any old case control study. You have people with a particular phenotype of interest compared to a group of folks without that phenotype of interest. And you look to see, do those two groups differ significantly based on allele or genotype or haplotype frequencies for any of these polymorphisms, okay? So the biggest advantage to a GWAS is that it gives the investigator a non-parametric way of, of evaluating the, the, the genotype-phenotype connection for, for that phenotype. So what's, what I mean by this is you, you, you know, you, you have all these polymorphisms that are up and down every chromosome. You then collect the data for those polymorphisms. You take that data, you analyze it, and you look to see what SNPs or what chunks of DNA um, look to be associated with my phenotype of interest. And then, only then do you look at, okay, well, this one is significantly associated. Let me see where in the genome this polymorphism that I have an association with, let me see where, that, where that's, you know, hanging out. And if it's hanging out in a gene, then you can look and see, okay, well, what gene is that hanging out in? Sometimes you're going to say, oh, that's a very logical gene. But a lot of times, and the benefit here is it could be a gene or set of genes that you weren't even thinking about would be associated with your phenotype of interest. So that, that's what I mean by, you know, a big advantage is, is you, let the, you, you collect the data and you let the data tell you what might be interesting um, from a biological point of view for your phenotype of interest. And, and that's a, a huge advantage when you think about the fact that most of us, the phenotypes that we're interested in, we'd be fooling ourselves if we, if we tried to say that we understood everything about that phenotype. So this gives us a way to circumvent um, the fact that we may not have all the knowledge that we need um, to a priori say what genes we would look at. We're just going to look at them all and let the data tell us, you know, what looks interesting. So that's a, that's a big advantage of, of a GWAS. Um, so some considerations and, and potential drawbacks 
Um, so it does require a large number uh, of subjects to conduct these studies. So if you think back to when I said, you know, folks are, are looking at, you know, a half a million SNPs, two million SNPs, um, you might be thinking to yourself, wow, that's a lot of data, and, and that, that would be very true. So multiple testing is, is an issue when you're looking at that many um, uh, variables. And so you need to look at large numbers of subjects to, to offset the fact that um, you're going to have to correct for multiple testing um, if you're going to um, uh, conduct these types of studies for the most part. Um, and, and that large sample set requirement does, um, you know, it, it turns some people off from, from doing this approach. Um, the other thing is there are some phenotypes where you would really struggle to get large numbers of, of subjects. And by large numbers, I'm, I'm thinking, um, you know, most po folks are saying you're anywhere between one to 2,000 cases compared to one to 2,000 controls, but the larger the better. You could think of some phenotypes where you would really struggle and maybe over the course of a lifetime, your lifetime, um, maybe not be able to collect all, all those subjects. But then there are some phenotypes that are amenable. Um, and this is why I see a lot of consortiums popping up um, for GWAS studies because um, people need to pool their, their resources. They need to pool their subjects in order to do um, some of these more non-parametric approaches. Um, the focus is on common variants. So, um, you know, unlike the, the whole genome sequencing where you're going to capture uh, rare and common variants, when you do a GWAS by you know, design. You are collecting data on common variants. And, um, but one thing that I do want to point out is when you have an association with a chunk of DNA um, that's in linkage disequilibrium with your polymorphism that's, that you have an association with, be mindful that that chunk of DNA um, could house a, a, a rare variant. And, and what's happening is you have an association with this common variant, but it's a surrogate for a more rare variant that's, that's hanging out in that block of DNA. Um, it is an association. So, you know, sometimes we have to remind folks that an association is not mechanism. And so when you have association, um, you need to be mindful you have an association with a chunk of DNA, um, which may, you may actually have an association with a surrogate marker for something else that's going on in that chunk of DNA. And so your work really isn't done. Um, you, you, you need to characterize that chunk of DNA or chunks of DNA a little bit better. And um, you may need to figure out, well, what is, what's the function of, of the variability that I'm seeing in that, that chunk of DNA um, if you're going to get a little bit closer to mechanism. And, but, but a lot of times when we talk about conducting candidate gene investigations, a lot of times the data that goes into what candidate genes you, you investigate, a lot of times that data comes from a GWAS and the data pointed to some very high priority candidates for us to look at for a particular phenotype. So um, gene expression profiling. So again, gene expression profiling has been around um, for, for, for a while. And if, if the, the whole basis of gene expression profiling is, is based on the fact that in every gene, in, in, I'm sorry, in every cell of your body, you have all the same genes represented. So every somatic cell in your body, whether it came from lung, whether it came from skin, whether it came from um, the lining of, of, of your mouth, whether it came from the lining of your gut, doesn't matter. If we took those cells and extracted DNA, um, there, every gene is represented in those cells. But not every gene is needed in every cell. And so not every gene is expressed in every cell. And so what we do with gene expression profiling is we actually look to see um, can we um, characterize what genes are actively expressed in a particular cell, a particular tissue um, of interest. Now, why would that be interesting? Well, if you think about um, comparing um, uh, genes that are differentially expressed between two different phenotypes of interest, that could tell you a lot about the underlying, the biology of the underlying uh, phenotype. So what differentially expressed genes are there um, that you can characterize that can, that, that can tell the difference between your, your phenotypes of interest um, could be clinically useful. So an example, so if you had, if you had a phenotype of interest 
you could look at tissue from an individual that has the condition compared to that same tissue in an individual that doesn't have the condition. You compare the gene expression profiles from those, those tissues and genes that are upregulated or downregulated differentially between the two is going to say a lot about um, what might be, what concert of gene regulation might be going on that's leading to your phenotype of interest. Um, for example, you could even look at the cellular level within an even within an individual. Um, for example, you could compare healthy tissue within an individual to unhealthy tissue, so tumor tissue. So, you know, what genes are up or down regulated in um, tumor tissue versus normal margin? And you could capture a lot of information about that tumor. Um, by, by looking at what genes are up or down regulated. Now, we actually exploit this gene expression profiling clinically already. And while I, I don't want to talk about a lot of different commercially available um, you know, uh, assays and, and things like that, I, I suffice it to say that, that there are gene expression profiling um, arrays that are being used clinically. One particular example for risk stratification, um, for prognostication, for tailored intervention, um, a really good example is in breast cancer, where a woman who has presented with breast cancer, her uh, breast cancer, her abnormal cells um, involved with her breast cancer, those are taken and clinically characterized using gene expression profiles. And being able to say what genes are up or down regulated in that woman's tumor tells us a lot about what type of, of breast cancer she has. Breast cancer is very, very heterogeneous. So what type of breast cancer does she have? What is her potential prognosis? What therapy, what type of chemo or other adjuvant therapy might work best for that individual with breast cancer based on the biology of her tumor. We are already doing this. This is already being done clinically. For those of you who are involved in oncology, you're well aware that we are using gene expression profiling, um, not just in research to figure out what genes are important to what cancers, but um, we're actually using them, them clinically to make some very important uh, decisions for, for, these, uh, for these patients. So gene expression profiling relies on uh, RNA. So the, the sequencing that I talked about, GWAS that I talked about, in those situations we are looking at the bases of the DNA. Here we're looking at RNA. So, um, and, and when you're talking about looking at RNA, you can look at a particular type of RNA from a particular candidate gene, or like a GWAS, you could actually look at the, the level of gene expression for every gene across the genome. And what you can do there is you can actually, you know, at the most basic level, do what you did with a GWAS. You could look at every um, um, piece of data that's generated across the genome for gene expression. And you could look at each piece of data. You could say, okay, I'm looking at this level of expression for this particular piece of RNA, and I'm looking to see is if it's um, associated with my phenotype of interest. And again, if, if it is, then because you looked at it, you looked at all the genes, you looked at it from a whole genome point of view, a non-parametric point of view, you might see expression of genes that are up or down regulated from that whole genome approach that you expected to be altered in, 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 in its expression, or you might find some novel genes or novel pathways of genes that you wouldn't have expected to be involved with your phenotype of interest. So that's, again, you know, one of the benefits of, of the non-parametric um, evaluation. And um, just like GWAS, you can look at those individual pieces of data um, for gene expression, or you could look at um, how uh, genes might, you know, expression of one gene um, or a whole host of genes taken together might impact your phenotype of interest. 
So a couple of other things that I wanted to, to point out that are um, emerging. Um, microRNAs are um, becoming very, um, we're, we're learning more about them. We don't you know, claim to know everything about them at this point in time. Um, but they're very interesting. They are definitely involved in gene regulation. Um, not so much involved with uh, um, our, like messenger RNAs are with trans taking that, that template and translating it into a protein. These RNAs are not involved with making protein. They're involved with gene regulation. And what they are is um, small pieces of RNA that are transcribed, and they are the antisense to messenger RNA for another gene. And the antisense RNA from, from the microRNA hooks up with the messenger RNA from that other gene and basically prevents it from being translated into a protein. So you can imagine how um, these, these microRNAs are impacting gene regulation. It's another level of gene regulation that you can, you can assess. Now what's interesting is if you do these whole genome gene expression data collections, um, a, a lot of the, the standard platforms and technologies that are out there now for you to do the whole genome expression evaluation includes um, most of the, the microRNAs that we know about. You'll, you'll simultaneously not only evaluate expression of, of annotated genes, but you'll also evaluate expression of the, these microRNAs also. Um, so again, you know, lots of advantages to doing it, um, a whole uh, genome expression. Um, you know, a couple of things that I, I did want to point out. Um, because we're, we're talking about RNA here and not DNA, um, some things that you have to be mindful of when you are conducting this type of research or when you're evaluating publications of, of this type of data and when you're thinking about clinical utility of this data. Um, you know, DNA is, is very hardy, extremely hardy. RNA is not. So folks who are working with RNA need to stabilize, appropriately stabilize their RNA. That's an important factor to consider because if you are looking at a publication and you're not, you don't feel confident that they um, stabilize their RNA, then you have to call into question, you know, how valid are their findings and then how applicable are those findings ever going to be um, to the clinic. Other um, issues with um, gene expression. So gene expression differs across tissues. So, you know, if, if you know, remember when I said, you know, you take a, a lung cell, you take a kidney cell, you take a gut cell, take a skin cell, those genes are all there. The polymorphisms are going to be the same amongst those, those cells. Um, but what isn't going to be the same is gene expression. So when you're talking about doing a gene expression um, profile or you're talking about you know, doing research um, using gene expression, you need to give a lot of thought to what tissue is most appropriate for your phenotype of interest and that you, you are comparing apples to apples when, when you're comparing tissues because um, you can't necessarily compare a lung, um, lung tissue to kidney tissue with gene expression because just because they have different jobs to do, they're going to have different genes expressed. Okay? So you have to be mindful that you know, there's going to be variability from tissue to tissue. The other interesting thing about RNA um, that is distinct from, from DNA is that it is dynamic. Um, gene expression is going to change. It's going to change in response to exposures. Um, it's going to change in response to, you know, there, there are temporal changes to gene expression. There are genes that are expressed in early development that are shut off and, and no longer needed in, in, in the adult. So there, there are a lot of changes um, um, in gene expression. It's very dynamic, which is not something that we see in it, um, when we're looking at, at the basis of, of the DNA. So these are things that need to be taken into account when you're either conducting a, a RNA-based or gene, gene expression-based study or evaluating those types of studies out there in the literature. Okay, so um, a little bit about epigenomics. So our sequencing and our GWAS, we were interested in, in DNA. Our gene expression, we were interested in RNA. With epigenomics, um, you know, for the most part, we're back to looking at the DNA. Um, so, it, it, but epigenomics is, is different. Um, when you get back to the DNA for epigenomics, you're not interested in the bases. 
like you were um, with sequencing and GWAS. Um, we, we're not interested in what the G's, A's, order of G's, A's, T's, and C's are. We're not interested necessarily with the polymorphisms that are there. What we are interested in is, um, you know, how that DNA is chemically modified or packaged, okay? Now, the, the, the chemical modifications and packaging impact whether or not a gene is expressed. So when we talk about gene expression, there's something going on mechanistically to impact that gene being expressed or not. And epigenomics explains a lot of, of variability in, in gene expression. So it's one of the mechanisms behind gene, gene expression variability. Now, a lot of times people automatically associate epigenomics with um, DNA methylation. And I think that, that there's a good reason for that, and I think it's because um, you know, looking at DNA methylation is something that we've moved along with. Um, it's, uh, DNA methylation is, is the, the um, form of epigenomics that has gained the most research and clinical applicability. Um, there are some DNA methylation assays that are being used clinically, um, again, mostly in oncology. Um, but I did want to call your attention um, that there are many types of epigenomics, um, including histone modifications, um, chromatin structure, non-coding RNAs, so for example, um, you know, some of the, the micro RNAs would fit here, and DNA methylation. And so I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, there are many different ways um, that the, the DNA can be chemically modified or packaged um, under this category of epigenomics. So I am actually going to spend um, some time talking more about DNA methylation because that is where most of the research seems to be happening and it's certainly where most of the clinical utility for epigenomics has, uh, has occurred. So with DNA methylation, um, you're talking about chemical modification to the DNA. You're talking about addition of methyl groups, but not just anywhere in the DNA. Methyl groups are added to GC-rich regions of DNA. So where you see a lot of repetitive GC, 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 GC nucleotides, um, those are, are called um, you know, CPG uh, islands, and CPG island-rich regions of the DNA are susceptible to, to um, DNA methylation. So when a region of the genome is hypermethylated, you're basically shutting down that region of the genome. So when, when the promoter region of a gene is hypermethylated, um, that gene is not going to be expressed. When you get hypomethylation of a gene that's supposed to be methylated, you have activation of that gene. So you can see when we talk about um, you know, DNA methylation being dynamic, you can see what we're talking about here. You add methylation, you shut down a gene. You take it away, you reactivate it. And um, because DNA methylation is key um, in, in, for temporal gene regulation as well as tissue-to-tissue -tissue variability in gene regulation, you can see how genes can be turned on and off based on their chemical modifications. Um, so epigenomics does um, share, um, you know, some of the, the methodological issues um, with DNA polymorphism-based approaches as well as RNA-based approaches. Um, you're back with the DNA, so DNA is stable. And, for example, if you are looking at uh, DNA methylation, the methylation stamp that's on that DNA is also stable. You can, you know, you can extract that DNA and you don't have to worry about the instability that we have to worry about with RNA. Um, but what makes it a little bit like RNA-based gene expression is that it does matter um, what tissue you're looking at because the methylation stamp that's on the, the genome of a particular cell is going to be different than the methylation stamp on um, a cell from, from a different tissue. So like gene expression, you do have to be mindful of what tissue you're looking at. Um, and you do have to be mindful of exposures because it is dynamic. So, you know, one of the things that can make 
DNA methylation evaluation a little bit messy is, you know, it, it's impacted by exposures, both endogenous and exogenous. But I think what draws a lot of us to, to looking at epigenomics, um, and in particular DNA methylation, is that, you know, exposures do impact um, epigenomics and DNA methylation. And um, to that extent, we're interested in how our genetic material interacts with our environment. Now, you know, be mindful that, you know, we can only talk about what we know about today. And when I was in graduate school, we did not know much about epigenomics. We did not, we knew that some DNA was methylated. We knew about imprinting, but we didn't know the extent to which our genetic material interacted with our environment. And that actually could impact um, uh, methylation of, of our DNA and, and um, you know, the epigenome of um, our, our, our DNA or, and how our DNA is packaged. So, you know, you, with, with an epigenomic approach, you could look at um, one gene of interest. You could look at the methylation status of one gene of interest. You could look at the methylation status of a pathway of genes. There are assays out there to do that. Um, or like GWAS and whole genome expression profiling, you could look across the entire genome. So there are um, technologies out there that allow you to look at um, methylation status across the entire genome and um, in a non-parametric way take a look at, well, what regions of methylation differentiate my phenotypes of interest? Um, and so you, you, you can mix and match some of these um, uh, approaches um, and they overlap a lot, but there's, there's little nuances about each of these approaches that the researcher and the, the person who's thinking about using these approaches clinically needs to be mindful of, okay? So I did want to talk a little bit about um, implications for nursing practice and, and research. And so I'm going to pull directly from our paper. Um, we have um, a table in our paper that deals with how across all four of these different approaches that I've discussed, you know, how it impacts um, practice and, and, and research. So a couple of things that I wanted to, to point out, you know, some of the highlights. So when we talk about genome sequencing, um, it is interesting, you know, to, to think about the fact that you, you could collect an entire genome's worth of sequence and you could even do this um, you know, with, um, you know, antenatal testing, um, for example, um, a lot of folks are thinking that what we could do is move towards whole genome sequencing, um, you know, clinically and have that whole genome sequence sitting there so that when it's time to prescribe a particular medication, our um, healthcare provider can take a look and see, okay, there's key genes that regulate metabolism of a drug that we're thinking of giving you. So in addition to all of the things that we normally would take into account when prescribing a medication, um, we're also going to take into account your genomic variability. And so it would be there um, for us to take, to take a look at and, and make appropriate um, recommendations for therapy, for example. Um, and it, it sounds kind of futuristic, but there are a lot of folks who believe that at some point in time, we are probably going to have um, our genome sequences entered into our, our medical record um, and, and how we could utilize uh, those data. Um, Genome-wide association studies, again, um, particularly advantageous for, for common complex disorders um, where you're thinking more than one gene is probably involved. Um, gene expression profiling, I, I already hinted at some of the things that we're, we're using um, gene expression profiling for clinically. Um, and, and certainly in the breast cancer population, we are using um, specific gene expression profiles um, of tumor samples to help us with accurate diagnosis, um, prognosticating, um, figuring out what would be the best uh, treatment for that individual, and then post-treatment surveillance. Um, for example, when um, some oncology patients go back in for um, follow-up biopsies and follow-up surveillance, 
um, we can look to see, are we seeing what we would expect to be a quote-unquote normal gene expression profile, or are we starting to see some genes uh, abnormally expressed, and, and is, is that part, you know, cause for, for concern? And then with epigenomics, um, we, you know, we have some clinical utility where we do have some um, methylation assays out there for, for key genes of interest. Um, we know that loss of methylation and uh, of, of oncogenes is, um, you know, a, a reason for some types of cancer and can help us differentiate certain types of cancer. So um, some of those DNA methylation um, assays can do for us in the oncology patient what we were doing um, using gene expression profiling in, in the breast cancer patient, for example. Um, so lots of avenues for, for clinical implications and lots of possibilities down the road as, as these technologies continue to emerge and, and be, you know, and have more utility. Um, from the point of view of, of you know implications for nursing, um, I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir. You're you're all you know participating in this this webinar, so you know chances are you know you need more education. Um, but I think that that you need to spread the word. Um, you know, no doubt there needs to be um, you know uh, education efforts made, and I think that this webinar series is is a huge um, step in the right direction. Um, as far as, as research, um, clinical care, public health nursing, ethical practice, and then of course nurse leadership. Um, you know, there are already leaders amongst us that are looking to translate um, all of the, the new knowledge that is being um, brought to us through these, these emerging technologies, and then how are we going to use them. Um, to, if, clinically, and then what sort of, you know, ethical, legal, social issues might actually arise from um, conducting some of these technologies. So lots of implication um, for nursing. I'm sure, you know, um, th this was, you know, the tip of the iceberg for the paper, and I'm sure you guys could be thinking about additional implications. Um, so for maybe um, a couple more minutes, and then I'll stop and, and, and take uh, questions. Um, uh, I would like to, to talk to you a little bit about some of the databases and resources. So one of the things that um, myself and my co-authors believed very strongly was, if we're writing a paper about emerging technologies, particularly in the field of genomics, you know the paper's going to be out of date probably by the time it's, it's published. Um, or you know, how, how you know, useful is it going to be a year or two years down the road? Well, to add to the potential half-life of this paper, one of the things that we decided to do was to embed in the paper a multitude of online, reliable web-based um, resources that are kept up to date so that even if our paper um, gets a little bit out of date, readers would have resources to go to to bring themselves up to date to learn more about the technologies, um, not just how we describe them in the paper, but going forward, what's happening with those technologies, going forward, what data has been um, collected and, and stored in these databases. A lot of effort has been put into developing these databases, and, and folks, we need to use these databases. We need to use these resources. Um, so again, a couple of the, the resources that I wanted to, to point out. Um, I did want to point out um, ClinSeq. So um, you know, Dr. B. Secker, who is a, uh, a co-author on our, our paper, um, is the leader of the ClinSeq project at, at NIH. And so I wanted to give a call out for, for that because um, these folks are looking to um, develop clinical utility for whole genome sequencing. And so if you would like more information about ClinSeq, um, you can go to, to their website. Um, I would highly recommend you take a visit to the database of genotypes and phenotypes. Um, so when we talk about um, GWAS studies, for example, that have been conducted, and I'll see if this will actually take me out to, um, to this website. Um, when you take a look at um, you know, what's going on here, 
um, you could go to DV Gap and you could type in if your area of interest is, you know, cardiovascular. Um, I'll just put in cardiovascular. Um, you can see there's nine, there are 95 studies that have dumped into this database, GWAS data, that's publicly available. Now, some of this data is embargoed, and you, you, you may not have access to it right now, but a lot of it is available, and those are, that are embargoed will eventually be available. But you can take a look and see, um, you know, Framingham had 14,000 subjects in their study, and the GWAS data and phenotype data is available to investigators through the, the dbGaP. Um, the Jackson Heart Study, um, the you know large epi, uh, you know um, you know epidemiologic studies that folks uh, have seen in the the literature for years. Women's Health Initiative, Cardiovascular Health Study. Um, I would highly recommend that that uh, you guys go um, surf around on on the the DB Gap and see put your phenotype of interest in and see what GWAS comes up um, that you might be able to tap into. Um, Gene expression omnibus, or affectionately called GEO, um, is a clearinghouse for uh, gene expression data. Um, uh, if you want to know more about epigenomics, you can go to this website. Um, if you would like to see um, databases of um, epigenomic data, um, mostly what's in there is DNA methylation data, as well as um, um, some uh, chromosome uh, chromatin precipitation data. Um, the epigenome project is, is very interesting and contains epigenomic data from quote unquote normal individuals that you might find um, helpful to your, your research in particular for a comparison group. And then just a couple of others that I threw up here, and this is just a smattering of those that are in the paper. The paper has way more online resources for you to use. Um, genetic Test Registry um, and OMIM, very um, high clinical utility for you guys. Um, I'd highly recommend you surf around on some of these uh, websites. Um, and just to put a plug out for the next webinar, and um, I, I think we have time to take some questions. So thank you, Yvette. There has been one question posted. Far, if I can get to it and read it. Clarification. Can you give an example of an incidental finding and how it was handled? Is it like ELSI and is it related to research on that it was not consented to? Okay, okay. So um, as far as incidental findings, so um, in, the idea of incidental findings, that's not a new concept. It's new to, newer to us in genomics, but for example, um, in the field of imaging, incidental findings has been a problem. So if you, you know, do an image um, on someone because you need more data to, to clinically um, assist this individual, what do you do when you see something on an image that you weren't expecting and has nothing to do necessarily with the problem that your, your patient is having? Um, it's the same situation. So an example would be, let's say I do whole genome sequencing because I'm interested in, um, you know, uh, looking at an individual for, um, you know, let's say I have a host of genes that I want to look at variability in um, to say what their risk would be for cardiovascular disease or hypertension. And because I'm getting whole genome sequence, what if, you know, as I sequence through the Huntington gene, I find a run of trinucleotide repeats that are indicative of this person you know, having the mutation that at some point in time, if they live long enough, they're going to develop Huntington's disease. What do I do with that incidental finding? It's not of interest necessarily to my phenotype, my index phenotype, but I know that there's clinical importance to that finding. What do, what, what do I do? Now, what do I do if this is a de-identified sample? How much effort as a researcher do I now put into figuring out who is that individual? Because remember, a lot of the samples are de-identified for a reason. Um, if you know 
if you can trace back to the identity of that individual, would that individual even want um, to know that information? That's not necessarily what they signed up for. I have hypertension. I have cardiovascular disease, and that's what you were looking for. Um, now you're telling me that, you know, I, I have this other thing. Well, I didn't want to know that. Um, so there's a lot, I don't know if that answers this individual's question, but that's the sort of scenario that we see playing out potentially, um, you know, with, with, with the collection of so much data about what someone's genome looks like. So the next question, Yvette, is sequencing is the new light in the room of genomic research. Will future research require a blend of sequencing, epigenetic profile, and expression analysis? If so, this could be very expensive and laborious. However, it appears to be the ideal. Yeah, I, I think um, what is most desirable is usually most expensive. Um, so more data um, is, is always better. And I think what you described, where you're talking about looking at the sequence of someone's genome, and then you're looking at the, the um, you know, chemical modifications or packaging of that genome from an epigenomic point of view, and then you're looking at what genes are expressed as a result of all of the above, um, that allows you to tell a nice story. It allows you to start from beginning to end. Um, what do I see in the genome that could be associated with this phenotype, and, and why? So you're, you're getting the, the, the how and the why, um, which are very important pieces of the story. You're absolutely right. But one thing that I would say is we're, we're using a lot of these more global approaches that are more expensive with the idea that as we start to catalog more phenotypes systematically, we're not going to have to look at everything you know, down the road. We're going to know for this particular phenotype, we're going to have to look at this particular group of genes um, from both a, a variability, an epigenomic, and a, a gene expression point of view, but we won't have to look at everything. And so I think that's really what a lot of folks are hoping that we'll eventually get at. I don't know whose lifetime that'll be, but eventually we're hoping to get to the point where we um, have cataloged enough of these findings for every phenotype that we're interested in so that we, we're, we can very, um, be, be more focused. And then the cost won't be so high. So Yvette, this will be the last question. And just um, to let everybody know, this recording will be archived and available on this same Gov site that's listed on Yvette's slide. And this is also where you can register for upcoming webinars. And the links, um, obviously, in the tables are available in her article, which is the, uh, in the JNS issue. And so the last question, in addition to a very positive comment about how helpful this has been, was that for the Jackson Heart Study from dbGaP, do you know whether it includes the genotype or SNPs associated with metabolic syndrome? So, okay, good, good question. So, if you are familiar with the Jackson Heart Study or, or any of these large um, epidemiologic studies, if you're familiar with them from the literature, you have an idea of what variables they collected on these individuals. So, um, metabolic syndrome, um, I can tell you that they have a whole host of laboratory measures on these folks. They, you know, so they, ha they have um, glucose, they have, um, um, you know, uh, the, um, CRP. They have um, hemoglobin HC1. They have um, BMI. They have, um, you know, lots of information on these folks. These folks have, have had a lot of data collected on them over time. You would have access to all the phenotypes that they have. You could then, now whether or not they have metabolic syndrome, I'm not 100% sure, but you could certainly um, look at the individual variability, individual variables that you would take into consideration to, to come up with metabolic syndrome. Um, look at those individually or look at them as a whole as, as a syndrome. Um, but those phenotype data as well as the genotype data, now you have to apply for these things. You have to get, apply to get access. It's no longer um, available to the public. These things have, have gone to the point where now you have to ask for permission. But very rarely is someone turned down. Um, the main reason why someone would be turned down is somebody's already looking at that. 
Um, but if you're, you, you have a phenotype of interest, you can go and look and see what variables are available. You can go to dbGaP, it'll tell you what variables phenotypically are available and what platform they used for their um, GWAS data collection so that you would know how robustly covered um, the genome was in their, their GWAS study. Thank you so much, Yvette, for um, doing a wonderful presentation. I'll ask Kathy if you have any last comments. No, I don't think so. It was a great presentation of that. We really appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone. And for anybody who had additional questions, we will try and follow up with those individually. Thanks, Dr. Conley. We appreciate your time. And the slides from Yvette will also be posted on the genome.gov site. Till next month, see you soon. Thank you.